I will be talking about some general strategies for policy modeling this afternoon, but uh, I cannot promise that you can leave the room with uh, the full capability of modeling everything in the world, because part of what I will be uh, presenting is uh, uh, still uh, well work in progress. Let me start with a personal remark. When I finished my basic studies in political science uh, at, uh, well, in, in the early 1970s and started a very short but uh, quite influential and interesting career as a policymaker, as a member of the state parliament of the city of Hamburg, regulatory impact analysis became fashionable, not only in Germany but uh, also in the United States, for example. Planning, programming and budgeting was one of the buzzwords of the late 60s uh, when uh, politicians tried to find out what the results of their legislation might be, could be. I remember that uh, in 1969, after uh, the Social Democrats for the first time uh, became uh, the leading party in Germany, the office of the Federal Chancellor was immediately equipped with uh, a large, a very large, and computers were very large at that time, a computer with a very large database uh, uh, keeping track of uh, all the project that the new government had and uh, officers in the ministry had to learn uh, programming languages like APL at that time. Um, Microsimulation was used to forecast effects of tax and transfer changes and my first contact with uh, simulation for policy modeling uh, was a simulation program which tried to predict which schools and at which places in the city of Hamburg um, would be needed a couple of years uh, in advance in order uh, to uh, be able to school all the pupils, uh, all the children near their homes. And shortly after, this buzzword became a very silent word. Nobody talked about planning, programming and budgeting any longer. There were articles in influential journals um, telling that uh, this approach was not very successful, at that time at least. And it was also the time when system dynamics made its way into the public. Um, dynamics of growth in a finite world by Meadows and uh, these simulations tried uh, first of all to predict the fate of the planet and its, pop and its human population and uh, tried to recommend strategies in order to preserve us from the worst. Uh, but even this uh, was over in the late 70s, I think, and uh, only in these days, past decade, I would say, uh, simulation, social simulation, simulation in political science came back uh, to policy modeling in various academic and applied projects. Uh, Nigel already mentioned, without uh, <laughs> saying the names, the FIRMA project, uh, a policy modeling project. There were several uh, urban dynamics projects and a couple of projects in agriculture. Um, currently, I'm a member of the Prima uh, project, uh, which deals with land use change uh, with sustainable ag uh, uh, agriculture. And uh, as of uh, the beginning of last year, in Koblenz and several other places, we started into a project which we call Okopomo, uh, open collaboration in policy modeling. Um, opening policy modeling, which was impossible in the early 70s, uh, to a much larger audience than offices in ministries and uh, members of parliament. And uh, this in the second part of my talk, I will uh, tell you at least a little about the first achievements uh, of this project. Regulatory impact assessment came back to the public in a white paper of the OECD in 2004 and during the past few years um, and even during the past few months and uh, even last week uh, we learned about uh, what is now called stress tests during the financial crisis and uh, stress tests of nuclear power plants uh, after the uh, Fukushima catastrophe and in Germany 
uh, we are facing the results of a big simulation of the new Stuttgart railway station, uh, where the public participates, well, not really in the model building, but in the analysis uh, of the model, trying to find out whether the plans of uh, the German railway company uh, to set up a much more, uh, uh, much more fast uh, railway station in Stuttgart will come true. We will see the result perhaps 15 or 20 years from now, but uh, it is the simulation uh, which is now in the minds of very many people. In the meantime, mainly in the 1990s, um, starting in the mid-80s perhaps, and uh, still very influential, uh, we had another view on simulation, and uh, many of the <coughs> presentations um, of the participants, which I <coughs> could follow yesterday and today, uh, still were of the type uh, of uh, setting up artificial societies, uh <coughs> answering the question, can you explain it, with the... Uh, also question, can you grow it? So can we set up a model which from a given uh, micro-specification leads to a macro-structure which it explains then? So in this case, and I think this period was necessary uh, in the 80s and 90s and in the first decade uh, of this century, um, we returned back to the problem of first understanding a social or political process before trying to make any predictions. But before, and even nowadays, at the other end of a very long scope of simulation approaches, we have this micro-analytic simulation. Uh, the uh, micro-analytic simulation association is meanwhile uh, 52 or 53 years old, uh, much like the System Dynamics Association. So uh, social simulation has a longer history than many of us might, uh, might keep in mind. This kind of simulation starts from a large collection of observational data, uh, which I think uh, nearly none of the uh, projects of the participants uh, do. Um, observational data on persons and households, the population as a whole, and tries from uh, this initialization and uh, estimation of some parameters uh, to predict, and really to predict, uh, the structure of a population for age, gender, um, educational status, uh, and so on, uh, for the next uh, decade or even 20 or 30 years. Uh, in this kind of simulation, tens of thousands of software agents are created with data from real-world people and the authors of such simulation promise that they can predict uh, the future of a nation, of a national economy, much the same way as meteor meteorologists can predict the weather for the next week. Uh, and when we see that predictions, weather forecasts, are not very precise for the next week, um, why should we believe that uh, micro-simulation forecasts or predictions should be more reliable and for longer? Uh, period. But anyway, microanalytic simulation has been one of the main features of uh, policy modeling when um, people try to find out what the results of certain political activities, changes in tax laws or transfer laws uh, were. They relied on uh, this kind of micro simulation uh, not only to find out what the well, average tax load of a typical household would be, but also and this was one of the, I think, better achievements of microanalytical simulation to find out um, what the percentage of old aged people would be 40 years from then, or also from now, uh, who would need some care because they would not have any uh, uh, close relations, uh, sons and daughters and uh, partners. And uh, this result of a micro simulation, uh, well, stood at the very beginning of a legislation process in Germany introducing the nursery uh, compulsory insurance. So it was used for, uh, well, for designing political processes. I think I don't tell anything new when uh, the next slide is about simulation as a thought experiment. And I come back to what I presented, I think, 14 years ago uh, in one of the first uh, international simulation conferences. We use simulation 
as a thought experiment, which is not carried out with the help of our own thinking, but with the help of a machine. So in a way, we export uh, our brain and our mind into a machine. And uh, this thought experiment, as all thought experiments, has not a direct interface to the target system, to the political system, uh, to an enterprise or what have you. Uh, we try to answer a question like, given our theory about our target system holds, and given our theory is adequately translated into a computer model, how would the target system behave? I think this is behind all the approaches uh, that uh, you were talking about during uh, this week. In most of uh, the presentations, you have an, uh, a target system in mind, which you replace with an artificial uh, simulation model and uh, you want to draw conclusions from uh, your model either to find out whether your theory is adequately translated into a computer model uh, and whether the results are in any way reliable, which uh, Iris discussed in the morning, or you even want to find out how the target system would behave in the near future. Um, and this has several different meanings and uh, before I come uh, to any details of policy modeling, I would like to discuss these meanings in order to find out that there are several steps um, for uh, policy modeling. The first of these meanings is which kind of behavior can be expected under arbitrarily given parameter combinations and initial conditions. And this was what uh, Iris displayed in the morning. Um, and uh, we can then uh, statistically analyze of the output of our model in order to find out what the scope of potential behaviors of the model is like. If we already have a given target system whose parameters and previous states we might have measured at some degree of precision, we could be interested in which alternative futures are possible. Only the alternative for, uh, futures uh, are of interest here. Um, and this is, I think, what uh, we can do and can promise. What I think still we cannot answer is the question like this one. Which state will this target system reach in the near future? Not which kind of behavior will it? Will there be a polarization? Will there be a breakdown? Will there be a continuous growth? Uh, no, the third um, answer would be the uh, precise percentage of people over 65 in the year 2040 in the northern half of Germany, so for example. Um, I still believe that uh, we will not be in a position uh, to answer this question in any precise manner. Um, but perhaps it is possible to answer question number four. Which state will the target system reach after we applied some political strategies? Perhaps even here we should uh, introduce the, pure, the, the plural which states are possible, which states can be expected uh, of the target system after we applied some political strategies. And this is the typical question uh, which we try to answer. Uh, for example, uh, in my, one of my first examples when I wanted to know how many uh, school buildings would be necessary in the southern district of, Ham of uh, Hamburg in, I think it was 1977, um, um, the same applies to uh, whether it will be possible uh, to have 48 trains per hour uh, coming into and leaving uh, the future Stuttgart uh, railway station. Um, these are the typical questions we want to answer. But uh, this is not enough for policy making, as I uh, will talk about a little later. First, I want to give you several examples of this uh, standard uh, style. One is about urban development, uh, which was um, done by uh, a PhD student who uh, finished her PhD thesis at the end of 2009 and defended it very successfully. Um, perhaps this might be interesting for where are there our colleagues from Colombia? Uh, ah, no, no, your colleague Elizabeth. Um, because um, at least some of the techniques that Flavia Fertosa uh, used at that time uh, might, be, might be useful uh, for your project too. Uh, she um, modeled an explicit target system, namely a city 
uh, in the state of Sao Paulo in southern Brazil and tried to find out um, how the segregation of poor and rich households might continue uh, for, um, for the next decade and uh, started her simulation in 1990, uh, had it run for 10 years and could compare the simulation results with real data. I will show you some of the results on one of the next slides. The idea behind was that she had uh, an agent-based model. So one of the central concepts was the household agent, uh, which has something like a description, an agent profile, uh, and uh, a transition module rules um, governing the behavior uh, of a household, moving or uh, staying at the same pl place. I will come back um, to the behavioral strategies on the next slide. In order uh, to find out what happens for the whole region, of course we have the population, which is just an aggregate of the household agents with uh, no individual uh, properties, one could say, only aggregative ones. Uh, for technical reasons, she had to introduce household groups uh, because um, it, uh, at least with NetLogo, it uh, seemed too complicated uh, to uh, model each household uh, independently because she wanted to know um, what the urban landscape would be after the next month, the month after, and so on. So households uh, decided to move from their current place to another place. Um, which, of course, changed the urban landscape. I will show a picture a little later. And she added an external factor module with which uh, she was in a position to apply some political strategies to this artificial population in order to be able uh, to talk about the possible consequences of this or that strategy. The core of the model is uh, the rules which the households can apply. So in every round of the simulation, every household has the alternatives staying in the current location, moving within the same neighborhood, moving to a similar neighborhood, and moving into a different type of neighborhood. Types of neighborhood were mainly defined by um, the composition of the socioeconomic status uh, of the people living there. Uh, so this means that uh, a different type of neighborhood would either be um, a neighborhood in which the percentage of rich people was either higher or much lower, while um, a similar neighborhood would have more or less the same composition of, uh, well, to keep it simple, um, rich and uh, poor people. Uh, every household calculated the utility of these four alternatives, but of course it is not only four alternatives, because um, uh, staying in the current location and moving within the same neighborhood uh, had all the same um, uh, utilities, but different similar neighborhoods in the town, a very large city of uh, half a million inhabitants, could have different utilities, and this of course also applies for different types uh, of uh, neighborhoods. So uh, the Household agent in this net logo simulation model had a lot to do uh, in every time step, uh, which led to the fact that uh, a single 10-year simulation lasted one weekend, uh, which of course um, well makes it impossible to run 1,000 simulations in order to find out what the distribution of outcomes uh, was. Anyway, so then um, as usual, these utilities were converted into probabilities of uh, choosing one of the possible alternatives and in the end um, a certain uh, neighborhood was the future uh, living place of a household and uh, in the end when all households had taken and executed their decisions then uh, the urban landscape was uh, updated. So this is uh, what came out. Uh, Flavia was interested in the isolation of low-income households, um, a topic which we discussed uh, uh, during your presentation. The initial state in 1991 was something like this, so uh, the darker this red, the higher is the degree of spatial isolation of low-income households in these places, so which means that, for example, here there were no 
low-income households at all, but uh, most of them were concentrated somewhere here and here and here. Uh, and over they calculated an overall index. Um, and uh, during the next 10 years, the city of uh, São José dos Campos in Sao Paulo changed a little, as one can see here. Um, obviously, in many parts of these um, highly isolated low-income households regions, the isolation became less, particularly here. Only in this place, it became, uh, well, the density of low-income households in this place became a little larger. So obviously, some of the low-income households uh, moved to this place in order to aggravate uh, the um, concentration, but others uh, moved to other places. Um, and uh, uh, the overall um, segregation index um, decreased from 0.60 to 0.58, which was a significant uh, difference. And now we can compare what the simulation would have predicted if she had started the simulation in 1991. And uh, when you compare, well, uh, the differences between the initial state and the real data, and the initial state and the simulated data, you will find that um, not only on the aggregate level uh, we have uh, exactly the same number, but uh, also uh, the overall view on the city of São José dos Campos in 2000 through uh, the uh, looking glass of the simulation and uh, into reality look more or less the same, at least when we compare it to the original situation. Um, and this encouraged her, and I guess will encourage her in future, to use this model of this city, and perhaps um, after uh, some additional effort to use adaptations of this model to other cities uh, to predict um, segregation, migration effects of cities of this type, uh, given certain uh, external events, uh, applications of political strategies. I will not go into the details for reasons of time, but um, one of the um, political strategies that she applied to this model was um, giving poor people uh, transfer payment in order that they can afford more costly apartments. So uh, encouraging them to move away from regions of low-income households into more middle-class regions. And uh, she found out that this was at least a little helpful, uh, but uh, political strategies in order to encourage richer people to go to middle-class uh, or even poorer regions were not successful. This is not a big surprise, I think. Um, but uh, one can, of course, apply to this model, um, many different political strategies trying to find out what might happen. Um, the typical application of uh, simulation in other disciplines than uh, social science where one uses simulations for car crash tests and, and so on. So this was one example in urban development and uh, I think it is quite a typical example of um, a certain kind of policy modeling where it is only the experimenter which changes the rules, but there are no internal changes. So uh, whatever the strategies applied to the system are, the behavioral rules for the individual households remain exactly the same. And the structure of the model does not change. So let me come to another uh, model which I think I used for the first time some 10 years ago in the uh, FIRMA project where we were talking about freshwater management. And uh, this little example goes back to a paper written by a researcher named James Anderson uh, who described a lake in order to find out what would happen to this lake if uh, people, if farmers continued to discharge um, artificial fertilizer on the fields around uh, this lake and uh, would perhaps uh, eutrophicate uh, this lake. We called this um, virtual lake, Lake Anderson, and revisited, us, re revisited it 
in trying uh, to find out what happens if we enrich this system dynamics model uh, with additional types of agents. And I will come to the other types of agents a little later. Um, we, in any of the versions of this model, we have a, a dynamical model of what happens in a lake like, like this, when um, fertilizer, artificial or natural fertilizer from cattle, for example, um, is spread into the lake. Um, the increase of nutrient would uh, lead to a growth of biomass, and this biomass would consume much of the oxygen in the upper layer um, of um, the lake, which would lead uh, to death of part of the biomass, which would then be deposited on the ground of the lake, and uh, another, uh, this would be another reason for reducing the oxygen in the lake, and in the end, fish would float on the surface of um, an ugly smelling uh, lake, uh, the so-called eutrophication. Uh, the Greek work eutrophication um, reminds rather of something which is good because it begins with the syllable eu, e uh, which is the Greek word for something that is good, but eutrophication is a bad thing. In Anderson's model, much like in Flavia Fertosa's uh, model, it is only the experimenter um, who can find out what will happen with the model, but it is of course clear that no experimenter would be able to apply strategies like applying algaecides, harvesting algae, uh, bubbling air into the, the lake or dredging the detritus. This will be done by different kinds of agents and uh, these agents would have uh, to have some incentive to do uh, one or the other uh, of these activities including reducing the artificial discharge of uh, fertilizer, natural or artificial fertilizer. So in the next step, we introduced one or several local governments around this lake. And uh, of course, it is not uh, the activity of uh, the district council to apply algaecides, but they could at least command um, these activities uh, with their, uh, well, agricultural companies or what have you. So uh, in this enlarged model we have some information that comes from the lake and goes to the government and then uh, the local government or governments, if we are several, uh, use the information about the oxygen, the biomass and the detritus status um, to find out which of possible activities they would then start. In the next slide I will uh, show um, uh, well, the possibilities of um, these activities. But this is still not enough. We would also like uh, to be more realistic because it would be the farms who continued or stopped artificial discharge um, of fertilizer. And uh, in order to um, lead them to some um, other behavior, it would be necessary to have some incentives. For example, tax payment for discharging um, artificial fertilizers into the lake, um, or even forbidding uh, artificial fertilizers. And so the government would take another action, not um, controlling the artificial discharge um, themselves, but um, asking farmers to do something or to uh, stop doing uh, something. Um, I will not go into the details of the behavior of the lake. Um, this is done uh, in some detail, and if you are interested, you can look it up in, uh, when you download the slides. Um, I will just um, show you one example, one of uh, many simulation runs where no experimenter does anything, but um, the model starts with certain amounts of um, the oxygen level, the nutrient level, the biomass level, and the detritus level. So um, at the very beginning, we have a very high um, uh, oxygen rate, so a lively lake and uh, sufficient nutrient and no detritus, um, a very uh, healthy and sound um, lake. Um, then uh, we start this world and of course some nutrient is discharged, which leads 
to a decrease of the oxygen. And at this point, one can see something must have happened because um, the rule of at least two of four governments was if the biomass um, proportion um, increases above 0.5, then they will start harvesting algae, uh, taking them out of the lake in order uh, to save more oxygen. While the other two governments did nothing uh, because their strategy was to start work only when the biomass was over 0.75. And um, here we can see that uh, two of these governments would be very successful free riders. They would never have to apply their strategy uh, when the others uh, behave as they planned. But it could, of course, be that um, in another extension of, the, uh, of this example, uh, government number one and two apply to government number three and four, at least to pay part of the um, effort that has to be uh, done uh, for harvesting these algae and uh, preventing the lake from eutrophication. And of course, we can add even more classes of agents in order to make um, our system, uh, our simulation system, much more uh, realistic. Um, we had already the farms on one of the former slides, and we had the government agency, but we could also talk about uh, tourists who would uh, book or cancel bookings when uh, the lake starts uh, smelling, uh, and then the tourist board would lobby uh, the government agency, and so on. To find out what really happens in such a setting, one would have to talk to different kinds of people around uh, a lake that is in danger of being eutrophicated. Um, this was only a virtual example. We never talked uh, to people like this, but we do this uh, in uh, the uh, other, in the next examples. Um, I started with uh, talking a little about the open collaboration uh, in policy making project. Um, this is uh, one of the overviews. I will go into more details a little later. What we want to do is to define a process of model building, starting from narrative scenarios, uh, which we ask several different kinds of stakeholders uh, to give us, and then we try to translate these narrative scenarios into individual agent-based policy models. Then we want to run the simulations, visualize them, and discuss the output with the stakeholders in order, in the next iteration, to be able to, well, to fine-tune uh, the model. Um, the reason for this iteration is that we can never be sure that we translated the narrative scenarios of our stakeholders, the rules they were going to apply, the facts that they believe in, into uh, a formalization. And this is why um, the overall model is a little bit more complicated. Uh, this is the structure of the project and what I'm talking about is mainly the cooperation between these two work packages in this project. I think um, this is not so interesting now, but this is uh, what is interesting. So we have, in a way, two parts of the process with different background colors, um, as you can see here. This is the more or less verbal part of uh, the process description, and this is the more or less formal part. And um, at the interface of these two parts of the policy modeling process, we have what we call concept models, um, which we translate from the scenarios text by identifying the relational aspects um, that we are told by um, the stakeholders. So uh, the evidence of the stakeholders goes into the narrative scenarios, and then the narrative scenarios in natural language become more and more formal as far as this is possible with the help of natural languages. And it is translated into a formal policy model in a certain kind of language, which I uh, will describe a little later, which we call rule dependency networks. Simulations are run and they generate text 
at least of the same kind of these concept models uh, in the language and of course with visualizations which can be easily understood at least hopefully uh, by the stakeholders from which uh, from whom we had uh, the narrative scenarios and then we compare and this is the double arrow here the original scenario text with uh, the text produced by the simulation and uh, we continue this pro we will continue, I must uh, take the future because uh, we are still uh, in the first round somewhere here, um, in order to improve the formal description of the policies that the stakeholders um, are thinking about. And I use the plural for the word stakeholder because um, as in the uh, simple virtual model of Lake Anderson, we would have, of course, different policy makers um, governmental organizations, uh, local municipalities, non-government organizations, political parties, perhaps even individual members of local parliaments. Um, and all of these have, of course, different concepts, different scenarios that they can tell us, such that on this way, via the concept models, in the policy model, different kinds of agents will have different rules, much like of uh, the case of 2001 uh, in uh, the Lake Anderson case. To show you how we are going to do this, um, I take an example from the Prima project, uh, which I used to explain our policy modeling strategy to the members of this project. Um, this happened um, on a day after we had visited Hadrian's Wall in northern England and visited um, a farm where I um, had asked the farmer why they would not start cheese production. They gave me some reasons not to do this. And um, the idea was, one sentence in this scenario was, cheese should be produced by farmers along Hadrian's Wall. Now we have um, to uh, dismantle, in a way, this sentence. We are talking about agricultural products which should be produced by agricultural enterprises. So we have uh, three different categories, namely um, a state, namely the current production of agricultural products, and the goal, cheese should be produced, description of a desired future state of the same, uh, the same category, uh, the actual state and the desired state. The verb produced stands for a state change, describing ways and means, measures to be taken, and uh, agricultural enterprises belong to the class of actors in reality. Now, in the next step, we can characterize the different issues, and uh, perhaps in the case of agricultural products and production, we can use two different approaches. One, we are talking only about one product and the decision is whether this farm would produce dairy or wool or cereals or meat or beer or vegetable. Or we could also talk um, about the state of this agricultural production in a multivariate way. Um, and then we would have to ask our farmer as a stakeholder, uh, would he uh, want to produce dairy to 10% and uh, wool to 15% and cereals to 0% and so on. Um, so we have to ask our farmer what way he or she thinks uh, would they in a small farm perhaps produce only one of these alternative products or would they have a product mix? And, uh, and then we would have to ask them under which condition they would change their mix and what is necessary uh, to change uh, uh, this mix or to change from wool to dairy, for example, uh, produced, the state change would then be specialized into install a milking machine and uh, a cheese cattle to produce cheese. And our agricultural enterprises would have to be endowed with the rule base, um, effect base and goals. This would become the condition part of a rule in an agent's rule base, a fact in a way, and of course the goal would also be a fact. The action part of a rule would contain something like 
um, by an install uh, by a milking machine and a cheese kettle, um, and this rule base would then analyze the potential future. So what happens after the milking machine was bought? It consumed some money and it will produce uh, some additional milk uh, faster and perhaps uh, uh, more cleanly. Um, so on the next slide, well, we support this with the help of a computer-aided qualitative data anal analysis system in order to be able to document all the steps taken from the left end to the right end and uh, even further on the next slide. At the end, we will have a fact-based and a rule base for each at least type of agent, perhaps for each individual agent. So we might have different agents around Hadrian's Wall, different farmers. Some would dare to change their production to cheese, others would not. The one we visited uh, did not, for good reasons, I think. And uh, when we now go a little bit further, the facts would be described as a current distribution of agricultural products produced. And in some computer language, this would look like this. Class, environment, state has the instance variables, uh, a real valued variable called product, class, percentages, and array. Uh, something about the soil capacity, uh, something about the length of summer, something about the price of cheese, which will of course change over time. Perhaps the length of summer will change over time too, uh, but only at a very slow pace, and so on. Um, these two slides um, would be the typical input uh, to our policy analysis and modeling process and would be uh, documented um, at least as precisely as on these slides. So back to the overall process structure. What is in green is more or less complete and can be done. Uh, we are still working uh, with the uh, computer-aided uh, qualitative data analysis system, but we are making fast progress. So, so far we document these steps more or less manually, uh, but uh, the user interface uh, for the transmission for the translation is uh, more or less complete now. And uh, I think by the end of the year uh, we will be able in the next review meeting of the EU project to show how it works. And uh, when there is another simulation summer school next year, I hope I or some of my colleagues will be able uh, to give you some final results. For all this we need, of course, um, well, a simulation toolbox, uh, the meta model of which consists of mainly agents, behavioral rules, which influence the actions, actions, of course, can be structured, one action can be part of another action. Actions are related to policy domains. Um, sometimes very different policy domains influence each other. One agent, and we had this in Germany a couple of weeks ago, uh, one agent is willing to agree to stopping nuclear energy only when the other party of the German government agrees to tax reductions. These two uh, policy domains have nothing to do with each other, but in the political negotiation process, sometimes um, they are related to each other. And of course, uh, when we want to predict possible futures, for example, of the current German governing coalition, it might be necessary uh, to talk about different policy domains at the same time, not only about agriculture or uh, the eutrophication of lakes. Um, agents uh, will uh, have different kinds of relations. Agents can interact with, with each other, but agents can also be members of another agent and can also be subsystems of another um, agent. So we have a very wide variety of agents which we can uh, use in a policy simulation because sometimes we have, let, this, let me give an example, um, um, uh, a party in parliament is a subsystem of the parliament and the individual members of parliament are both members of the parliament and of the 
uh, parties in Parliament, the fractions of a, and uh, all this um, we want to be able to to model. How do we do this? Um, we have usually two alternatives when we write computer programs, including uh, computer simulations. We can do this either with languages such as NetLogo or Java in the procedural way when we describe to the computer how it should work, which steps it should prefer, uh, perform one after another. And the other opportunity is the declarative way where we only describe what remains invariant and leave to the computer or some background program uh, to find out how the invariants can be uh, can hold. Um, personally, I have and uh, Koblenz has some experience in declarative languages. Twenty years ago, we designed um, um, micro and multi-level uh, software uh, called Mimosa, which we used for some time uh, to talk about simulation and to do simulations. Um, meanwhile, it is obsolete. Uh, Dynamo, the language of system dynamics, also is a declarative language which only describes uh, what remains invariant. The change from one state to another depends on certain other states and this is the only um, rule that the program has and has to e execute. Um, there are, beside the functional one, there are also logical declarative languages. Uh, many of you may know Prolog or at least have heard um, of this um, uh, computer programming language. Mm -hmm. Some of you, Bruce, for example, uh, has some experience with SDML, mm -hmm. a strictly declarative modeling language, and we are currently uh, designing what we call DRAMS, a declarative rule-based agent modeling system, uh, which I will explain at least shortly in a, a few minutes. We use, um, in our declarative approach to part of the modeling, uh, what we call forward uh, chaining, uh, which is an alternative to backward chaining. Backward chaining starts with the possible future state and finds out whether and under which conditions this future state can be reached given some transformation rules. So the answer of a backward chaining um, program would be it is impossible to reach the goal or it is possible to reach the goal given the following transformation rules hold and the following uh, facts are uh, describe the current state. Um, this is of course interesting to find out whether a possible state uh, or a desired state can be um, achieved, but um, we want more. And I think forward chaining uh, can help us a little further because this starts with a description of the current state, a very large fact base or fact basis, because different agents can have different beliefs, so they have their own fact basis, and rules. Again, some global rules and some local rules for agents, and these rules transform any current state into a future possible state, generate new facts. This is the typical case for declarative languages, and this means that this forward chaining can predict, but in quotation marks, several future possible states. So we can derive from the current state, with the help of the rules, which states are possible in future and which are not possible. And as we have perhaps conflicts between the rules of different agents, we can, for example, find out that a plan that one of the agents has and finds in principle uh, that uh, this plan can be carried out, would fail because some other agent prevents this plan from coming to. And it could also happen, and my personal political experience tells me this, that a plan fails even when both negotiating agents believe uh, it can come true, but each believes of the other that the other would like to prevent this plan from coming true. So one had uh, has a very uh, bad situation. Both want to achieve the same goal, but they believe about each other that the other does not want this plan to come true, and uh, this leads to a, 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 to a complete failure. The declarative rule engine in Kopomo, or rather in uh, DRAMS, consists of fact base, rule base, 
and the rules, um, of course, uh, consist of a left-hand side, um, the condition part, and the right-hand side, the action part. And the inference engine controls the inference process by uh, selecting, processing the rules which can fire on the basis of the, condi uh, of, uh, of the conditions of the facts in order to draw conclusions from existing facts. The rule engine represents its rule quite close to natural language descriptions. Um, the, sentence, well, the statements in this rule base can easily be uh, retranslated into if-then clauses. Um, and if-then clauses are quite familiar in all natural languages. Um, and uh, when we give the uh, objects uh, reasonable names, then even the program text can easily be understood uh, by the stakeholders from whose scenario descriptions we derived um, the rule base. So we believe that this approach um, is quite similar to human reasoning and problem solving, much more similar than the um, imperative, uh, the procedural approach. Usually, we, most stakeholders are not in a position to tell a computer what the computer has to do in the next and the next and the next step. The rule, um, rule engines are part of the agents, so when the agents reason about possible future state, they use this rule engine, this expert system, but when they have other activities, sending each other messages, for example, uh, then uh, we use imperative code. Um, the problem of existing software products and the reason why we uh, implemented our own system was that um, most of the existing software products uh, work with static fact bases. So as soon as one fact uh, changes, um, the whole fact and rule base has to be recompiled, uh, which is a bottleneck in dynamic simulation data because these expert systems were created for entirely different um, uh, problems. And um, existing software products also restrict the agent autonomy because it is very difficult for them, um, uh, for these software products, to give every agent its own rule engine. There's only one shared rule engine, so um, this again uh, would be, well, unrealistic. So, in the end, we have two parts of the simulation system. The simulation framework, which is in a way at the bottom, which our stakeholders need not uh, know about, and the declarative rule engine, where agents have rule engines, and uh, of course also fact bases. Um, perhaps one arrow is missing here. Um, the simulation framework, controls the rule schedule, and the rule schedule would then ask the next rule to fire and to enter something into the fact base. And we are also thinking about uh, meta rules, rules that cannot only change facts, but also rules. What we do with our forward chaining, with our distributed forward chaining, is what I already um, explained a little earlier. Um, several agents may have different rule sets and perhaps even different descriptions of the current state. Usually, politicians of different parties have a different worldview and different beliefs in what, even what exists and what is possible. And um, some of the possible futures which one agent predicts as a possible future may exclude some of the possible futures other agents might predict. So our forward chaining, agent per agent, um, yields um, something like a tree of possible futures, and the next agent has a tree of the same kind and one branch on the left-hand side of the right-hand tree would prevent a right-hand branch of the left-hand tree from growing further. So we would find out uh, which um, of the possible futures of one agent become impossible uh, due to the fact that another agent prevents uh, this. And we are also thinking about uh, negotiations between agent groups. Remember the example of two very different political uh, uh, domains which um, are 
part of a negotiation between coalition partners. I uh, wonder whether uh, the British Parliament will make such uh, experience as I have made for 40 years now, the process of uh, coalition governing. I think I have uh, talked about most of the DRAMS design with the distributed rule engines and arbitrary number of agent types um, is uh, already possible with type-specific rule base and initial fact base configurations. These are derived from the scenario description. Each of these types can have an arbitrary number of instances. Um, currently, we do not need so many for uh, each of them, but uh, the software uh, is uh, prepared for an infinite or an indefinite number anyway. And there is, of course, also one global rule engine containing the word knowledge. And uh, this global rule engine um, describes, in a way, nature that part of the world that cannot be influenced by policymakers. Agents uh, can communicate among each other, either by writing something to something like a blackboard and by sending each, each other messages, such uh, they can write to other agents and perhaps even uh, read. But uh, there is no mind reading and no mind writing. Uh, all this has to be done via messages. So. Uh, the general schedule is um, for every time step, all, fa uh, all facts are considered and all agents are looked at for which new facts are available. And for each agent instance now, each agent processes in its declarative engine uh, what it is going to do according to these rules. If uh, something is true, then execute the right-hand side, generate new facts, send others messages, and so on. Uh, so all this, meanwhile, is workable, but the time would not allow that uh, I show you one of the, well, of the toy applications which we have. Uh, and uh, I don't think that the toy application would be really, um, uh, well, a good thing to do at the end or nearly at the end of such a wonderful uh, summer school. So next year we will be able to describe uh, the current scenarios in two parts at, well, uh, at the border of the European Union. Uh, this is nearly very well near the border to Ukraine and this is near the border to Libya in a way. Uh, so it is bordering regions which you were, inter which you were interested in. So uh, we believe, and this is taken from uh, one of the leaflets of the Okopomo project, that uh, the current economic and financial crisis and our inability to predict dramatic changes in the economy and society and our ease in ignoring warnings are all factors that shed light on the need for more effective and efficient governance and policy making processes. And we hope that we will be able to support these policy making processes. Uh, and we hope that stakeholders will make use of this potential. Uh, meanwhile, we have one possible customer, a regional administration on Cyprus. So thank you for your attention. And we have still uh, a lot of time for discussions and your comments.